Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Former President Trump talks openly about the raid video and his response to Letitia James's lawsuit. We'll give you the highlights and other updates from the special master. Long-awaited action on police reform unfolds in Congress. A package of bills that Democrats say is the answer to rising crime. But Republicans say the timing is telling. Big bank CEOs grilled over what they would do if China invades Taiwan. How they respond as lawmakers warn them about funding the communist regime. Another military lawsuit is underway in response to religious exemptions for the COVID-19 vaccine being denied. A Coast Guard service member tells his personal story. Recently exposed videos show Vanderbilt University professors speaking on their transgender medical clinic. Lawmakers are now calling for an investigation. Former President Trump explains why he hasn't released video of the FBI raid and responds to the new lawsuit by the New York Attorney General. NTD's Arlene Richards has that and more updates on the special master's review. Former President Donald Trump told Fox TV's Sean Hannity in a recent interview why he hasn't released video footage of the Mar-a-Lago raid. Well, they've asked me not to do it because they feel the FBI agents might be in physical harm, in danger. Trump also explained why he believes he declassified all the documents. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. He said there doesn't have to be a process as he understands it. But National Security Attorney Bradley Moss told CNN that's not how it works. He said there were three cases during the Trump administration where records that were verbally declassified were rejected by the courts. Trump also responded to the recent lawsuit filed by New York Attorney General Letitia James. This was just a continuation of a witch hunt that began when I came down the escalator at Trump Tower. He said he didn't think James would file the lawsuit because she doesn't have a case. In the lawsuit against Trump, the Trump Organization and its senior executives, James claimed they are responsible for $250 million worth of financial fraud. And the DOJ got its way Wednesday when an appeals court reversed part of Judge Eileen Cannon's ruling that blocked the FBI from resuming their investigation. That means Trump's lawyers and the special master are now prevented from seeing records marked classified, and the FBI can begin reviewing them again. Special Master Deary released his plan to review the more than 10,000 remaining documents. He also proposed that a government official swear that the government properly listed items taken from Trump's home and left open the possibility that the government may need to return some of the seized materials. Trump and the DOJ can now object to components of the plan. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. On to the congressional probe of January 6th. Virginia Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, has agreed to interview with the committee. Mrs. Thomas's lawyer confirmed that the interview is voluntary. He says that she's eager to answer the committee's questions and clear up any misconceptions about her work relating to the 2020 election. She was in contact with Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and reached out to lawmakers in Arizona and Wisconsin in the weeks after the election. A lawyer for Mrs. Thomas previously said she had no role in the January 6th breach. And some Democrats, eager to decouple from the defund the police slogan, pushed a package of police funding and program bills today. While some Republicans supported parts of the package, others pushed back, claiming it would federalize local policing. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with the details. This police reform legislation is a package of bills. One of those bills would provide federal funding to smaller local law enforcement agencies. Another bill would create a new grant program designed to train and dispatch mental health professionals um, to respond to emergencies which involve people with behavioral health issues. But for departments to qualify for this new grant money, there's a catch. The Mental Health Justice Act of 2022 reads that the federal government will manage the program in consultation with the Department of Justice. Intervention, de-escalation training, public health and social work training, all administered by the increasingly corrupt and politicized Department of Justice. 
This legislation would expand the federal bureaucracy unnecessarily, take over the responsibility of local governments. Most all Republicans voted no, with all Democrats voting yes. Two other bills in the package provide grants, one for violence intervention, the other to help stop violent crime. Colleagues, join us in backing the blue. And 30 Republicans indeed joined the Florida Democrat in passing her bill. Another police funding bill, the Invest to Protect Act, won overwhelming support from both sides, with 153 Republicans joining Democrats with a yes vote, though nine Democrats, so-called progressives, opposed it. Across our country, we have seen a rise in crime, and this is at a time when it's harder than ever to hire, recruit, and retain officers. In fact, it would provide grant money to police departments with fewer than 200 officers to help them recruit more officers, purchase new equipment, and more. But even amid considerable Republican support for the police funding bill, some in the GOP say the timing is telling. An election just over a month away, House Democrats now want to pretend they actually support law enforcement. The Invest to Protect Act has the best chance of succeeding, considering the overwhelming support from Republicans in the House. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Major banks pulled investments from Russia after the invasion of Ukraine, so now the question turns to what they'd do if China invades Taiwan. Top bank executives are grilled in a congressional hearing. NTD's Iris Tao has more on their answers. Top executives of the largest U.S. banks are here testifying before Congress and getting pressed on thorny issues like China. Should the CCP follow through on its threat to invade Taiwan, are your banks prepared to pull your investments out of China? We'll follow the government's guidance, which is, have, has been for decades to, do, you know, to work with China. And if they change that position, we'll immediately change it as we did in Russia. The questioning comes as lawmakers warn about risks of investing in volatile nations ruled by dictatorships. And number two, your investments play a significant role in supporting those nations' economies. And here's what the head of J.P. Morgan says when asked. If an invasion of an American ally would be enough for J.P. Morgan to make the moral determination to stop doing business with the Chinese Communist Party? Well, we'll have to decide when that happens. And on the question of they support a free and democratic Taiwan. I support freedom and democracy everywhere. I'm not going to specifically comment on Taiwan. Wall Street giants, including J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, have in recent years tried to expand their businesses in China, the world's second largest economy. And Senator Tommy Tuberville tells NTD that more people need to recognize the Chinese regime for what it is. They're our number one adversary, but we've got a lot of corporations that are pumping up. China and uh, giving them the opportunity to finance what they need to in their military to possibly one day go into Taiwan. Meanwhile, China responded to the hearing on Thursday saying the U.S. should stop making an issue out of Taiwan. The acrimony comes as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Friday and Taiwan is expected to be a topic of discussion. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. A judge in Indi Indiana today blocked the state's near-total ban on abortion. The law had just gone into effect last week. This means abortions up to 20 weeks after fertilization are allowed to resume in Indiana. State lawmakers passed the law in August, and it went into effect on September 15th. The law bans abortions at all stages of pregnancy, but it provides exceptions in cases of rape, incest, or when the woman's life is in danger. Abortion providers in Indiana filed a lawsuit against the ban, arguing that it violates the right to privacy in the Indiana Constitution. The judge in this case granted their request for a preliminary injunction while the lawsuit continues. And Georgia Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams is also commenting on abortion. She said at an event on Wednesday that there's no such thing as a fetal heartbeat at six weeks of pregnancy. She went on to say that, quote, it is a manufactured sound designed to convince people that men have the right to take control of a woman's body. And now over to military vaccines. A Catholic Coast Guard lieutenant is facing an involuntary discharge because he refused to get the COVID-19 vaccine. He filed a lawsuit to stop the dismissal and says he just wants to serve. And TD's Arlene Richards has that story. 
Ever since he was a kid, Lieutenant Alaric Stone has been involved in the Catholic Church. I was an altar server uh, while I was young and heavily involved uh, both in high school and then also while I was uh, at the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, volunteering for any position that I could. When he signed up for the Coast Guard, it was out of a desire to serve his country. Serving in the United States military had, was something that I knew that I had wanted to do since I was very, very young. Like I had mentioned, uh, I drew part of my inspiration for that from my faith and also part of it from my family who have a long tradition of service. He never expected that one day his faith would be tested and he would have to sue the Coast Guard to continue to serve. Stone is the lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit recently filed against the U.S. Coast Guard to stop them from discharging him for exercising his religious beliefs. Stone says it all started when he applied for a religious exemption from the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, my accommodation request was very thorough. I laid out both you know, the reasoning for my request as well as uh, the reason why I thought that it was reasonable that I, re I was making such a request but his request was denied. When you were given that response, did you feel that your request had gotten individual attention uh, as required, I believe, by their policy? Uh, no, I did not feel like my accommodation request had received individual attention. And part of that came to the content of the denial. He said the denial memo he received cited some generalized concerns regarding mission readiness. NTD reached out to the U.S. Coast Guard and asked how they handle religious exemption requests. We didn't hear back from them before broadcast time. In May 2022, Senator Ted Cruz asked Admiral Linda Fagan, the highest-ranking member of the Coast Guard, why only four out of 1,300 religious exemption requests were granted. And she said, we've got a process that considers each request on its uh, on its merits. I don't have the specifics of each of the cases, but uh, if there was no uh, no no grounds for the request, then they were they were not approved. The Defense Department's inspector general said in a June 2022 memo that there was a trend of generalized assessments in violation of federal law and DOD and military service policies. Despite the denial, Stone is still going to work every day. He said he doesn't get the training he needs to do his best job, but he's not deterred from serving. Well, I still want to serve and, you know, be as much help to the other men and women that I serve with as possible. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. Coming up, the death toll rising in Iran during anti-regime protests. It began after a young woman died under the watch of the morality police. What an expert on Islamic terrorism says the U.S. should stop doing to help their people. And in basketball news, a prominent NBA coach could be in line for a lengthy suspension. And today's Dave Martin has the details. That and more after this short break. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you prevent wildfires. Dude, I've got this. I've been camping since I was five years old. But I am a camping influencer. You know what, I'll bet you five bucks. Okay. Assistant Smokey, what is the best way to put out a campfire? Mm -hmm. To put out a campfire, drown with water, stir, drown again, then make sure the fire is out cold by feeling with the back of your hand. Wait, really? I'll take the five bucks. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Congress? We're great. Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. And more in health news. Videos expose some of the practices at Vanderbilt's transgender clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. Now some lawmakers are calling for an investigation. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. Writer and speaker Matt Walsh, host of The Matt Walsh Show, recently tweeted videos of Vanderbilt professors speaking about Vanderbilt's transgender clinic. Here, Dr. Shane Taylor of Vanderbilt says transgender surgeries are huge money makers for hospitals. 
estimate that they're quoting around twenty thousand dollars for a phalloplasty. There's been different things that I've read that said it could be up to one hundred thousand um, dollars. Dr. Winokur, who's our surgeon, says that there's entire clinics where the entire clinic is supported just by their phalloplasties, and that is like a fraction of the surgeries that they're doing. And for those who may be opposed to supporting transgender surgeries because of their religious beliefs, Dr. Ellen Clayton of Vanderbilt gave this message. That saying that you're not going to do something because of your conscientious, because of your religious beliefs is not without consequences. If you don't want to do this kind of work, don't work at Vanderbilt. One of the videos Walsh says he got from Vanderbilt Psychiatry's YouTube channel shows just how young some of their patients are. So we have some individuals who have started gender affirming hormones at 13 or 14. To be if they are 16, 17 here at Vanderbilt, um, if they have been on testosterone, have a parental consent, um, we're able to do a lot of the top surgeries for those patients. Vanderbilt has now issued a statement saying they require parental consent to treat a minor patient. The statement also says their policies allow employees to decline to participate in care they find morally objectionable and that they don't permit discrimination against employees who choose to do so. The website for Vanderbilt's Clinic for Transgender Health has since been taken down. Matt Walsh responded to their statement on Fox News. They don't actually factually dispute anything in my report because they can't, because everything that I said wasn't me saying it. I was just providing video evidence. Much Tennessee Governor Bill Lee is now calling for an investigation, and he has the support of Senator Marsha Blackburn and other Tennessee lawmakers. Jason Perry, NTD News. Turning now to Iran, where there is a rising death toll as protests rage on over the recent death of a 22-year-old woman who had been detained by the regime's morality police. Earlier today, I spoke with an expert on Islamic terrorism about this. Cynthia Farahat is a fellow at the Middle East Forum and author of the book The Secret Apparatus, The Muslim Brotherhood's Industry of Death. She believes the U.S. is supporting the Iranian regime and that this legitimizes its murders. Cynthia Farahat, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, do you think Iran is at a crossroads in terms of the women's movement right now? It has been for a very long time. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not anything new. Uh, uh, Iranian women are uh, fed up with the abuse. It's a uh, gender uh, apartheid state. Uh, it's incredible. It's the most misogynistic regime on the planet, uh, uh, just like Afghanistan, like the Taliban regime. And uh, unfortunately, they do not have allies in the West. And what are you hearing about what's going on for people on the ground there? There is utter rage and despair. Uh, out after the. Uh, um, uh, the assassination, the brutal slaughter and murder of uh, Masa Amini. Uh, there is a lot of women who are protesting very courageously and burning the headscarves to show the world that this is not uh, just one person. This is all Iranian women. These women are hostages and they need an ally in the West and they do not have an ally in the West. Specifically, they do not only don't they have an ally, they, I would say they have someone working against them in the United States government when they have deals with these mullahs to boost their dictatorship. Because right now, apparently, uh, State Department is in the business of dictatorship maintenance. Uh, and that's, that's why they're assisting uh, these uh, mass murderers in the um, Iranian regime. The U.S. is on the brink of potentially renewing the Iran nuclear deal partly what you may be referring to there. Do you think that in light of these protests, which reveal the opposing values between Iran and the West, that the U.S. should rethink such a deal? They have to rethink such a deal. This is a, this is a deal that doesn't only take all of the Iranian people hostages. This is, a, this is a deal that straps a suicide belt around the planet's waist. These mullahs believe that it's their duty to bring about the end of times. That's a quote, by the way. Um, I, I don't know how that's a good idea. And if you notice, when there were talks also about the Iran deal in 2015 with 
the President uh, uh, Barack Obama's regime, uh, the same thing was taking place. Iranians are protesting and getting slaughtered in the streets while we in America were legitimizing their murders. Now, back to what's happening in Iran. Iranian officials defend the compulsory hijab as the cultural norm. What's your view on that? It's not the cultural norm. It's n it has never been the cultural norm in Iran. It's only after uh, Ayatollah Khomeini perpetrated 1979 Islamic coup. Uh, that's why that that's when they mandated that was the mandate. Before that, Iran looked like um, Sicily. Uh, so that's not part of their culture. It has never been part of their culture, and. Uh, women have every right to be able to wear what they want. Talking about misogyny, where are all the feminists in America now? All right, thank you so much, Cynthia Farahat, author and fellow at the Middle East Forum. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. And the Iranian president has canceled a long-planned interview with CNN. It was due to take place in New York on Wednesday. He abandoned it because the CNN anchor declined his request to wear a headscarf. The anchor says she would not cover her head during an interview with an Iranian official outside Iran. And a rights group says Russia's security forces detained more than 1,300 people on Wednesday at protests, hours after President Vladimir Putin ordered Russia's first military draft since World War II. Here's more. The independent OVD Info Protest Monitoring Group said that according to information it had collected from 38 Russian cities, more than 1,300 people had been held by late evening on Wednesday. It said that those figures included 500 in Moscow and 520 in St. Petersburg, Russia's second most populous city. In Moscow, protesters chanted, No to war! We should have been afraid before. The worst already happened. A group of women protesters chanted, Life to our children. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. The most valuable thing that they can take from us is the lives of our children. I won't give them my child's life. It won't help, but it's my civic duty to express my stance. No to war. Russia's tough penalties for spreading disinformation about its so-called special military operation have made public anti-war protests rare. The Moscow prosecutor's office on Wednesday warned that organizing or participating in unauthorized street protests could incur up to 15 years in jail. Video published by a news service in Georgia showed a large number of cars queuing to cross from Russia into Georgia at a crossing on Wednesday night a few hours after the partial mobilization was announced in Russia. Traffic had also been seen surging at border crossing with Finland, with prices for air tickets from Moscow to nearest foreign locations rocketing to over £4,000. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Roger Federer will conclude his career by partnering with longtime friend and rival Rafael Nadal in a Labor's Cup doubles match on Friday night. Federer had previously requested the arrangement as a fitting way to end his stellar career. The duo met 40 times on the court over the years, including nine matches for the championship of a Grand Slam, with Nadal taking six of them. And it was Nadal who stopped Federer's record streak of 237 weeks at the top of the ATP rankings back in 2008. The pair will face Americans Francis Tiafo and Jack Sock. Federer, who's still recovering from knee surgery, will then be replaced by Matteo Berrettini for the rest of the event. In other tennis news, Novak Djokovic said he's still waiting to see whether he'll be allowed to play at the Australian Open in January. The 21-time Grand Slam champion who's unvaccinated against COVID-19 was famously deported from Australia earlier this year after attempting entry. The 35-year-old has won the event a record nine times. In NBA news, both the Associated Press and ESPN are reporting that Boston Celtics head coach Ime Udoka is facing a possible suspension by the team because of an improper relationship with a member of the organization.
The team has not revealed any details publicly and the length of the suspension has yet to be determined. Boston won the Eastern Conference last year in Udoka's first season as head coach before losing to the Golden State Warriors in the finals. And tonight in sports, eight baseball games are on the schedule, including a Yankees-Red Sox matchup where Aaron Judge sits just one home run away from tying the AL record. And in the NFL, the Steelers and Browns renew their rivalry for Thursday night football. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And lastly, 2022 has been another rough year in terms of fighting California's wildfires. The co-founder of a tech company in the Midwest told NTD's David Lamb how his team is helping the fire lines with drones and software. Drones dropping flame spheres may sound like a futuristic battlefield technique, and in a way, it is. It's giving firefighters another meaning to fighting fire with fire adding tech into the wildfire control equation. It's the brainchild of the Drone Amplified team. The CEO and co-founder Carrick Detweiler has been with the company since 2015. So we have um, our Ignis system, which attaches to uh, drone systems, have these little ping pong balls. So they're, they're these things that are actually have a chemical inside and relatively inert to start out with but right before we drop them we puncture them and inject them with a second chemical that starts a reaction right after we drop it the company refers to them as dragon eggs which ignite after 30 to 60 seconds later to start a small fire the system is used to start back burns and controlled burns eliminating fuel ahead of out of control wildfires so it's it's great to hear you know what the firefighters say. I mean, they often are just saying like this is a game changer. Detweiler told NTD there's a labor shortage and wants to provide tools to help make firefighters' jobs more effective. And got connected with the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, and realized that there was actually a lot of challenges involved in um, combating these wildfires, in particular the dangers of aviation and just the need for more people and and looking at how the technology could actually fill this gap where you know where there just are not enough firefighters to do the job safely he says cal fire uses their systems yeah so we have uh, more than 100 systems out in the field right now um, a lot of those are with the you know federal agencies u.s forest service and bureau of land management but you know there we have systems in california with cal fire and oregon uh, Colorado all the way to Florida. Drone Amplified is looking to scale to larger systems that can cover more area and also smaller systems for agility. David Lamb, NTD News, California. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free. With a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.